Welcome to Nick Luck Daily, the USA interviews, episode three in this series. And over the course of the next 12 months, I'm talking to those people who lead and those who aspire to lead. As the American horse racing industry engages in its most critical battle of ideas in history. Who's best placed to steer this ship through the choppy waters? Who has the vision, the skill, the integrity, the wherewithal to keep horse racing relevant and to make us care? My guest this month is Lisa Lazarus, Chief Executive of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, HISA, and the closest this modern day sport, anyway, in the United States, has come to a national chief regulator. A native of Montreal, she was Ivy League educated at Penn before embarking on a notable career in sports law and regulation, taking in a decade at the NFL, six years with the FEI, the International Equestrian Federation, and four years on all things equine in private practice. Almost exactly two years ago, she was thrust into the limelight in horse racing, charged with bringing harmony to a divided sport, with unifying racetracks and horsemen who, albeit well-intentioned, had simply been doing their own thing quite merrily for years, and all this at the behest of federal government. To put it bluntly, her task, against the rather grisly backdrop of doping scandals and the highest profile fatalities, was to clean up the sport and to stop horses dying. All the more difficult when critics of HISA say that it goes too far with arbitrary medication rules. Louisiana Representative Clay Higgins said last fall that while the government may have good intentions in practice, it ended up obstructing best practices in the business. Lisa Lazarus says, I've been working for regulators for most of my career. Nobody ever likes the regulator. It's impossible to make everyone happy. Lisa Lazarus, welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Are you really somebody who who doesn't mind not making people happy it's a it's a rare quality you know it's a very funny question because in my personal life i am completely to the other end of the spectrum you know i sort of feel like in personal relationships um, i'm always trying to make everybody happy but i think what i've recognized in this role is that you really need to tune out a lot of the noise and ethical be ethical be fair um but you just got to look forward and do the job based on what you think with all the information that you have at your disposal are the right decisions. Um, and, you know, I've sort of done that by, by, you know, blocking out a lot of Twitter noise and, and other things, because otherwise you could spend just sort of way too much time trying to navigate that. And I think one of the reasons why I was selected for this role, or I was actually appointed this role is that I have, you know, experience in equine anti-doping and horse welfare from my time in equine law and at the FEI, mm -hmm. but I don't have the relationships, you know, that pre-existed. I don't, I don't have the horse racing relationships over multiple years that make me want to make, you know, certain people happy or comfortable. So do you actively shy away from creating those, those relationships? So I, I would say that I, I create the relationships of trust um, with stakeholders that, you know, obviously need to be considered, need to be part of the conversation. But I go, I work very hard to make sure that nobody thinks that I'm available to do favors or to bend the rules or to, you know, treat anybody differently just because of who they are in the sport. So tell me what it is in Lisa Lazarus's background, childhood upbringing that informs this very strong ethical streak. You know, um, I think the first thing I would say is um, my father was a lawyer. Um, he recently retired. He was a sports agent um, back in the early days of um, of kind of representation of players. We grew up in Montreal, so he represented a lot of the Montreal Canadiens, and we had a baseball team at the time, the Montreal Expos. And I watched him go through a lot of conundrums and sort of difficult calculations on what the right thing to do was. And he was really a great, a great role, role model for me. Um, I also lost my mother quite young. She died at 44 of breast cancer. And I think some of the lessons that I learned from, from that experience and helping to raise my sisters because I'm the oldest um, also gave me kind of strength in knowing at the end of the day, um, you know, this isn't brain surgery. People aren't dying. You're doing your best to make good decisions. Um, people are typically not dying. Doing your best to make good decisions. And, and I think sometimes we go through more difficult things in life. Um, it provides a very strong foundation, um, particularly, I think, in careers. Do you remember your mother? Yes, very well. I was, I was, in, I was in college at the time, um, but I had uh, I have two younger sisters who were 
in their teens, one was 13 and one was 17. And so, you know, most of my focus was on sort of getting them through that and, and moving back home to take care of them. That's a huge responsibility for somebody of, of that age. I mean, at the time, could you really think about it or were you just muddling your way through as best you could? You know, I think I was one of the things that was a blessing is that I knew that I really had to take care of them. And also my father, who really struggled, um, you know, at, at the time he was, you know, also in his late 40s and, you know, it was really difficult. So for me, I was, you know, what what gave me the strength was knowing that I had to be there to support my family. And that has given you the context, the personal context against which you can you can play out your your public career and do that without perhaps feeling the pressure that other people might. I think so. I really think so. So in in the context of of this sport, tell me a little bit about why you feel that you were you were qualified in terms of your in terms of your knowledge, in terms of your your horse uh, enthusiasm, in terms of um, your background at the FEI. What was it about all of that 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 made you qualified for this? I think there were a couple of things. I think one is. You know, the time that I sent to the FEI as general counsel, um, the context of that was quite similar to what we faced in horse racing in that I was hired um, right after the Beijing Olympic Games. Um, and you you may or may not recall that, um, well, the, the question events were in Hong Kong, but there were a number of horses that tested positive. It was quite a scandal. And actually, the FEI was facing um, a challenge from the IOC as to whether or not they could maintain their place in the Olympic program, given the horse welfare issues and the sort of social license issues. And so at the time, they had a far less um, rigorous anti-doping program. And so I, my job when I first came in was to revise the whole structure and to essentially adopt, well, I made the decision to adopt the World Anti-Doping Association's human program, but customize it for horses. And um, it was 133 national federations, you know, a lot of different languages, different cultures. And I had to get everyone on the same page, and it was really difficult. And the, you know, the notion that that in in in, in a equestrian sports it's the riders, but the, as opposed to the trainers, where the riders had to have responsibility for anything their horse consumed, was in a lot of ways revolutionary at that time, and faced a lot of um, pushback. But ultimately, it was it's been an incredibly successful program. You know, uh, equestrian sports doesn't face those challenges, at least not sort of in the doping sphere. And um, I think every Olympic since has been clean. So uh, so really, it was a very big step forward. And, and I think that when I talked about that in the interview process, it resonated with a number of the board members. Um, I also, you know, my tenures at the NFL, I was on the football side, I wasn't in like marketing or business for most of my time there. And so I had to, you know, stand up to a lot of very well resourced, um, influential owners and tell them that, you know, we couldn't do it this way, or they were going to lose that case unless they made this concession. And I think probably those experiences, um, they thought best prepared me. And I think also the third thing is horse racing. It, there's so many relationships, right? There's families, there's breeding relationships, there's, you know, they, they really run deep in so many sectors. And I think there was also some attraction to the fact that I had the technical knowledge and experiences in like industries but I was not beholden to anybody. You know, I didn't come from the jockey club or the breeders club or a particular, you know, perspective on the trainer side that I was really coming in as like a fresh, uh, a fresh template. Do you need to like horse racing or love horse racing in order to do your job? I don't think you do. I don't, but I do love horse racing. Um, I love horses. You know, I mean, like I certainly my time at the FBI, I absolutely fell in love with horses. Um, and I did grow up with quite a bit of horse racing. We had a, a racetrack called Blue Bonnets that was very close to my home in Montreal. And, you know, it was my father's sort of favorite place to to take us um, on the weekends. And, you know, I've made the joke before that he used to tell us he was taking us to the zoo when we were little. Um, so that our mother wouldn't know that he was actually taking us to the racetrack, but spent many, many days there and um, have always been a huge lover of horses. Do you have friends who have nothing to do with horse racing who ask you why on earth you have taken on a role like this? All the time, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I also have friends who ask me, like... What do you, you tell them? Safe. You know, I tell them that um, it's part of... American history and culture. I tell them that there is 
no population in the world, in my view, that loves their horses more than trainers or 99% of trainers. Um, and that I think it's an incredibly important industry to preserve um, for all the people who work in it and for all of its history. And I think, you know, once I kind of walk people through it and walk people through the pageantry and, and just that incredible connection between horse and trainer, horse and jockey, um, I think they understand it. Lisa, you talk about social license. It's something that is talked about throughout major horse racing nations. Nobody has security, it seems, in terms of the sports relationship with the with the wider public and, and whether it should should exist anymore. Um, where do you think horse racing, particularly in the United States, went wrong in the preceding decades in terms of allowing the relationship and the trust between itself and that wider public to be somewhat eroded? You know, I think where... We, where horse racing went wrong, and again, I wasn't around for all of those days. This is a little bit of Monday Monday morning quarterbacking, but nonetheless, I'll share my view. I think it's one that still presents a risk today, which is that people that are in horse racing, you know, they know everything that trainers do and owners do and breeders do to support horses, to care for horses. And so it's sometimes hard for them to understand what the public sees. You know, if the public sees a high profile breakdown on Derby Day, they may not have seen the months before where that trainer or groom was going in every day and bathing the horse and feeding the horse and doing all those things. And so there's this perception that the external threat is not that serious. You know, it's not that real. Um, and I think what we've learned is that the public will give you grace and give you space and give you support, I think, if they see that you're really trying, you know, you're making changes, you're doing things, you're taking it seriously. And my perception is that previous to Haiza, that was that 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 message did get across. The public didn't perceive the industry to be taking it seriously, to be trying to reform, to be making changes, even if they were in certain places. Um, I think that, you know, that's the most important thing is that you actually make change and reform, but also that the public sees that, understands it and believes it to be authentic. You obviously had significant experience in in the area of doping. When you first came into horse racing, how clean or not clean did you believe the sport to be? You know, I really didn't come in with a strong um, view on that because you hear a thousand different opinions, right? And and many people view it very differently, you know, having lived the same experience. And so I really felt like I had to um, evaluate it on my own. Um, and my view is that it is a very, um, it really is truly a small minority, but nonetheless, that small minority Ooh. is hurting things for the rest of us, right? And so, or for the rest of the sport. And so we really, we need to do everything possible to eliminate the practices or even the presence of that small minority. And what I've always said is that I think our new program, it's gonna take a couple of years, but I think our new program is gonna answer that question. Um, Cause I believe that it's, that it's comprehensive and that it's gonna do its job. So you don't believe, or you didn't start with the belief that doping is simply rife or endemic or that the structure was such that frankly everybody was at it to a greater or lesser extent yeah i don't believe that um i really don't there may have been a time you know when that was the case but i think you know the five stones work and the prosecutions and you know the sort of beginning of beginnings of high as i think that's you know that's really had an impact um and you know, is it out there still? Sure, I, 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 it is, um, and believe it is. And like in any industry, there's there's a small minority of things, people who aren't playing by the rules. But I believe that there is a general agreement amongst the industry that that sector needs to go and that we all need to work together to make that happen. And of course, the industry needs to be confident that the regulator is ahead of the dopers. Can you give them that confidence? I'm optimistic that we'll be able to over time. Um, there's a couple of ways, you know, right, that that I think we do that. One is um, through investigations that we're still 
finalizing kind of the approach and the setup. But I think our investigations team is second to none, um, world class. And the things that they're doing with intelligence investigations are really revolutionary for the sport. They have never been done before and never been done at the level and never been done. You know, what's also great about being a national regulator is we do things across states, right? We don't have to, you know, like the minute the minute a trainer or, or, or a veterinarian leaves the state borders, we don't have to say, okay, now we no longer have authority to do anything. We, we cut across um, the whole country and that gives us a lot of a lot of um, authority and a lot of um, sort of tools in the toolbox. The second piece is we have, I believe, the best laboratories in the country working hard and, and using resources to, 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 you know, to fine tune testing, to create new testing. And what's also very important is that I think one of the biggest shortcomings of the previous state by state system is that there was not a whole lot of incentive for state racing commissions to invest money in research, to invest money in new tests, to invest money in their labs. I'm not, I'm not blaming them for that. They were beholden to state budgets and they didn't have the resources that were able to collect as, as high as that. And so we can really mandate that those things happen and we can invest in them. You know, previously it was, you know, maybe uh, the Grayson, the Grayson Docking Club Foundation that was doing so, and they've done a, a lot for the industry, but, you know, you still need the regulators to be pushing um, the laboratories and investing in the laboratories to make sure that we have these cutting edge tests. And also the data that we're collecting, um, which is really, again, you know, very big difference from the opportunities that state racing commissions had or, and have is is also just a game changer because we can use that data to be predictive about a lot of things, you know? Obviously we spoke to Stuart Janney, the uh, chair of the, the Jockey Club in the previous episode. And he was talking quite a bit about how the Five Stones process worked uh, and about how Service Navarro and their accomplices were were caught. And really all that was precipitated by, by wiretaps and undercover ops. And, and not really by you know, scientific work or, 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 or laboratory work. He also talked quite extensively about what he believed anecdotally or, or otherwise w were the ways in which a lot of people were cheating, which is the use of, of EPO or blood doping. Would you be able to tell your racing public now that your laboratories were in a sophisticated enough state to be able to detect people who were using EPO or blood doping agents? Our laboratories can detect that. Um, the question is, you know, whether or not they have the opportunity, whether or not samples are being collected at the right time, all of those things. Those are the things that we're getting much better at from an intelligence and investigation standpoint. And so as much as we can marry up those two pieces is how successful we're going to be. And I think we, we've gotten there in a number of places and we're going to continue to get to get better at that. Um, but you're right. You know, we still... We, we have a lot of those tools um, within HISA, like being able to have sources and being able to have subpoena, you know, subpoena power, et cetera, because we are created by federal law. So we will be able to make use of some of the same things. Obviously not, you know, we're not the FBI, so they're obviously gonna be, we don't get wiretaps, um, but we're not completely devoid of, of some of those tools that we will be, be able to continue to use to help our mission. That you feel the scope is sufficient to be able to catch the people you need to catch in your net? I believe that that's the case over time. I, I believe that in, in the next few years, we give us, you know, a few years to kind of get everything working as effectively as possible, that we'll be able to do that. But you're not there yet. We're not there for everyone yet. You know, we are we are doing those things and I'm and I'm optimistic that they're gonna bear fruit. But to be able to say that, you know, our job will be done, um, we're going to need we're going to need a few years. I mean, Stuart Janney talked quite openly about, you know, one time having to go to the toilet because he wanted to avoid someone who thought had won a bunch of stakes races unfairly and he couldn't look them in the eye when he was supposed to be out there in his capacity congratulating them. Have you in your capacity in, in this job in the last couple of years seen horse races and thought, oh, I don't like that. I'm uncomfortable with that. There's something about this result or this set of results or these percentages or this that makes me feel inherently uncomfortable. We look at those all the time, you know, and those things can be indicative. They can be red flags, but they're not always cheating, right? Like you do have those anomalies. So 
What I do when I see those cases or when we get intelligence in like that is I direct it to our investigations team or our testing team and we follow it up. So that's what's also so unique is we can get in a tip or get in a query about something that doesn't make sense and we can be on it within hours. You know what I mean? Because we're all we're all working all the time. We're all available all the time, you know, trying to get. Um, and again, it's no no disrespect to to racing commissions, but somebody on a weekend, like you know, who's a who's a government employee, to take a tip and and actually implement it was more challenging. They didn't have the same resources, and so we are now like just so connected and so nimble that I think um, the industry is going to see a lot of progress. Do you get a lot of tips? We get a lot of tips. I mean, to be a honest, lot. I guess we we all do. People put them on. Right social media the whole time but do you would you directly get what you would consider to be good strong intelligence so not me personally but we have a tip line um and and that tip line and we have a couple of different ways so we have a tip line through phone calls but what also has been i think a real game changer or at least my investigators tell me so is we have something called real text and real response where you can you can text anonymously to the investigators and, you know, in our world today, a lot of people don't feel like picking up a phone or they don't necessarily feel conf confident. And so the text tipping has also been um, really valuable. And it's led to, um, you know, some successful investigations already. I know you are very keen to educate people more about the difference between banned substances and controlled substances. And indeed, on the on the HISA website, you can you can look through all of them. I mean, it would take you a day because... I got to about page eight and I was still on A. Um, why do you believe it's so important to make people understand the difference between those two things? So I'm really glad you asked this question. I think it's really important. I think it's something that um, I believe, there's very few times I'll say that Heise has done a good job because I'm quite hard on us and hard on, ourselves, on myself, you know, for good reason. But this is somewhere I think we've really, really made a positive step forward. When we were going through all of the negotiations and particularly in the early days of USADA, there was a view that all prohibited substances should be lumped together, you know, and just one like viewed as the same as EPO or whatever. And, you know, coming from my FEI experience and, and knowing what I know about substances that are used in horses, I was vehemently opposed to that approach, as were a number of others on the committee. Um, and so we ultimately were able to all come to an agreement that we should adopt the FEI's approach, essentially, which is to make that distinction. And it's so important, right? Because in human sport, humans aren't prohibited from taking an Advil, like an ibuprofen, you know, the, way, the way you are in horse sport. And the whole category of substances that are completely okay and actually welcome between races um, is so different than a performance enhancer that should never be in a horse's system is clearly used um, to, to change a horse's performance. And it's so important for our social license that the public understands that. They understand that if a horse is disqualified from a from a you know a triple crown race because they use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, that that's an absolutely appropriate action to happen because the horse shouldn't have it in system and he shouldn't win. But it's not really doping. It isn't doping. It's not doping as the as the kind of the general public understands doping. And the reason why why I feel that's been successful is if you go through that list. You'll see a number of well recognizable names that have had medication violations, but no one's talking about them. No one's writing about them. You know, you don't you don't see any of the trades writing about you know so and so had a butte violation. Um, they just don't. I mean, they may republish part of the tables. They don't actually write stories. Where they're writing stories all the time, of course, about the banned substances, the doping substances, and I think that approach really does a good job of helping to educate the public about the difference. Because one is we have got to be super responsible with medication. A horse can't speak for itself. It can't tell you, you know, how it's feeling. And we can't just use medications on horses without restrictions. Um, but that is different than something that should never be in a horse. Uh, clearly, I, I don't want to labor the same ground over and again and, and I, I I really don't want to make this conversation about Baffert and Churchill again so say that it's racetrack A and person B now under HISA can we have a situation whereby racetracks and properties are enforcing their own statutory 
legislation, notwithstanding what you want to do with said in, said licensed individual, that they can just say, right. No, under, HISA yeah. preempts, you know, HISA preempts um, state law and, and, and any other regulations in the anti-doping space. We mm. take that whole space. So obviously the situation they're referring to happened pre hisa so we have no authority over any of that. Um, but I mean, but if, that, my, if that happened, if that happened in 2024, how would that all play out differently? Um, my understanding of how preemption works is that um, you, you couldn't a, a racetrack or a state racing commission couldn't give um, any covered person an additional penalty or sanction for an anti-doping violation. Now, could they, for other reasons, um, possibly, you know, if it's unrelated to anti-doping, if it's about reputational issues or, or et cetera, um, that would be something that I think a court would have to decide. But certainly under federal preemption, we're the only regulator that can punish somebody, a racing participant, for an anti-doping violation. And do you feel like you have buy-in on that from all the major racing jurisdictions? Um, I do. I mean, well, well <laughs> it hasn't been tested yet. Um, but but I think everybody, you know, understands that that's what the law says. Mm. I mean, that's, what, that's what federal preemption is, you know. Otherwise, if that weren't the case, then, you know, any racing commission could go out and start testing horses, which they know they can't do. And nobody tries to, you know. I suppose there's a wider point here. How well supported do you now feel? Do you now feel as chief executive advisor? How well supported do you feel by the by the major jurisdictions that are signatories to to, to the act? Very supported. I really do. Um, like overall, I, I've had an incredible amount of support. I think everybody understands that the future of racing depends on the industry coming together um, and working towards a common goal and the kind of like all hands on deck approach. Now, you know, if something specific happens that disadvantages a particular party, they may feel differently and that will have to be addressed at the time. But in general, I feel a tremendous amount of support. I want to talk about equine fatalities. You've just released some statistics just last week. Yes. Just talk, talk me through the data, first of all, Lisa, and then we'll dig a bit deeper. Yeah, so um, the equine injury database has been around since 2009 and they've done an unbelievable job, in my view, based on the fact that they couldn't mandate anything. You know, they had to get agreement. They had to get sort of, you know, everyone coming together and, and cooperating. Um, and so given, you know, I know how hard it is to do even with <laughs> the, the benefit of having, you know, the legal the legal imperative. So I think they've really, they really did a good job and they were, they're releasing, they were about to release their data. And so I felt that it was important that we did so at the same time that the public could understand that they were comparing sort of apples to apples. So um, the way that the equine injury database uh, counts racing fatalities is the fatality has to have occurred within 72 hours of a race, um, and it has to have been sort of race related. So we do count sudden deaths and all of that. But if, you know, if a, if a horse gets into an accident, um, you know, in a trailer on the highway or whatever, we wouldn't necessarily count that. But we're, we're looking at racing related deaths. And um, what they found was across the whole country, because they, they they get data from, I think there's also some misunderstanding about that. They get data from every single state and every racetrack. There are some states that don't publish their data and some racetracks that don't publish their data, but the Jockey Club actually, the Equine Injury Database gets all that data. And what they found was that um, it was, they, their number was 1.32 fatalities per thousand starts mm -hmm. across the whole country. Heise's number was 1.23 fatalities per thousand starts, which was just you know slightly lower than the overall number last year. And the, the reason for that difference is that we obviously don't get data or count the, the, the states that we don't have authority over currently, that we aren't regulating. And um, the other statistic that was very interesting to me is that the EIB found that um, if you were counting only non-Heise jurisdictions, not the whole country, but only those jurisdictions that are not currently under HISA rules, the number would be 1.63. So if you take HISA tracks versus non-HISA tracks, you're 1.23 versus 1.63, which okay. does suggest to me that we're, you know, that there's that there's some value. I'm going to come back to that HISA, okay. non-HISA point in a minute. What about HISA tracks relative to HISA tracks in consecutive years? 
So in terms of how are you tra- how are your tracks trending yeah. from say yeah. 21 to 22 to 23? Because yeah. that's kind of all you've got control over. That's that's all, all I can judge Very. you on. Yeah. So no, it's a great question. Um, and part of why I really felt um, very encouraged by our numbers is that, as you know, Nick, we had atypically challenging meets in two of our most historic and most well-resourced jurisdictions in terms of Saratoga and Churchill. So my expectation was that it was going to be very, very hard to bring our number down, given that two of our best performing states and best performing, you know, racetracks had such complicated years. And so their numbers were, were obviously not, you know, not very good. Um, so why I was so encouraged is that the racetracks where the Heiser rules were a real change, you know, that typically were under underfunded, underrepresented um, in terms of safety and integrity were the ones that showed the biggest progress. And those were, you know, frankly, racetracks that we spent the most time. And I'll give you a few examples. The racetrack um, that made the, the biggest change, the biggest improvement from 2022 to 2023 was Thistledown in Ohio. Ohio never had pre-race exams. They, you know, were underfunded um, with regards to safety. And again, not the commission's fault. It's just the reality that they had to work with. Um, and we brought a lot of resources into Ohio. We essentially took over um, all of the veterinary protocols. Um, Ohio did not opt into HISA as the state racing commission, but our rules applied there. And um, Thistledown was very eager to, to do better than management and to, and to improve things. And, and they really did a good job. Another example is Prairie Meadows in Iowa. Um, they also had um, they were, I think it would be third or fourth, definitely in the top five in terms of improvements 2022 to 2023. Another one is Rito um, in New Mexico. So and these were all places where we were heavily engaged because the, the delta between pre hiza and post hiza was harder for them to, you know, to overcome or to adapt to. And we provided a lot of support. Um, which is, I would argue, a little less challenging, perhaps, than a similar intervention in New York or or Kentucky, where we've clearly had major issues in in 2023. Even if the profile of those fatalities um, rather undermines the you know overall trend of equine fatalities nationwide, what are you going to do with Saratoga, for example? What are you going to do with Churchill Downs? So. My view is that the meets last year um, where there were, you know, atypical fatalities were, were, were really sort of unusual occurrences and not likely to repeat themselves. Um, and I say that because, one, we've done two very comprehensive reports, as you know, the Churchill report and the Saratoga report. We've engaged extensively um, with the management of both racetracks who are extremely cooperative, you know, are very dedicated to to making sure that we we respond to any learnings from those experiences. Um, one of the things that came out of both of those reports and investigations is that we need to do a better job of understanding like weather data and some of the 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 surface the, the impacts of weather on surfaces and how we potentially respond to it. We couldn't find a statistical link between, particularly at Saratoga, where they had historic rainfall, um, because we just, to be frank, we didn't have good enough data yet to be able to really, in confidence and with with genuine like authority, say there was a there there was a statistical link that we can prove. Um, It certainly feels like there was a link based on the numbers that we saw and and some of the trends, but we have um, really kind of doubled down on our engage with an investment in um, the racetrack services testing laboratory and working to to just make sure that that data is better integrated better collected um etc there's also been a number of um of changes we've made on the veterinary protocol side you know it's when we say that horse fatalities are multifactorial it's not a cop-out we're not trying to say we don't really know what it means we, we do know we, it's just more than one thing you know like the way that I like to think about it is that if somebody, a human has a heart attack, you know, you look at the situation, you could say, oh, he was overweight. Oh, he was under stress. Oh, he had high cholesterol. 
it's probably all of those things working together, right? Not necessarily just one of those things. And it's the same for horses. So the veterinary protocol side is also really important. It's not just all the kind of tracks fault per se. Um, and I think, you know, coming out of Saratoga also, we saw of the 11 musculoskeletal fatalities, three of them had intraarticular corticosteroid injections within 30 days of the race. We've already put, you know, in a rule change to the FTC to hopefully change that rule and prohibit that, which is what California was doing to their credit. Um, so, you know, we're taking all of those learnings and we're trying to integrate them going forward. And fortunately, we do have, and I say this really with all sincerity, we do have very cooperative racetrack management who, who you know, want to do the right thing and want to make sure that that this doesn't repeat itself. And I guess the importance of having a nationwide policy is that if you start changing policy, for example, on intraarticular joint injections because of research that you've done in New York, for example, out of a spate of fatalities, then people can't simply up sticks and move to Kentucky or move to California or move to Florida because they're going to get more lax, lax regulations there, which is what, what they could have yeah. done before. Exactly, which is yeah. why, I can just make one point about that, which is why I think that 1.63 number yeah. of, is significant. Because I think a lot that's what's happening in a lot of places is that horses that can't pass our veterinary inspections or, or, or even trainers and veterinarians that are suspended are going to West Virginia and Louisiana and racing there. And I think that that's, you know, I don't think actually that West Virginia and Louisiana were at the same, I actually have to look at this data. I, I don't know it offhand to be fair, but you know, I, I think they've had an increase um, in their fatality numbers in part because of that migration. This is a, this is a huge worry, isn't it? Because it is huge you know, a, a, an unintended consequence of seeking to, to bring all these states together is that you're creating unsafe ghettos where there's a devil make I'm gonna phrase this carefully. I was gonna say there's a devil may care attitude. That is gonna be misrepresenting a lot of people, but there is an attitude that we know best and you don't know best. And the numbers are saying that you're creating ghettos of racing that is much less safe than the racing that you're you're administering. That's really problematic. And to be honest, Joe Public isn't gonna give a monkeys whether it's at the fairgrounds or whether it's at at Saratoga. Yeah. No, you're 100% right about that. The public doesn't understand the difference. They actually don't even necessarily understand the difference between us and quarter horse racing or standard breads or even sometimes bush tracks, unfortunately. Um, so what do we do, but, Lisa? What do we do, what do we do about this? What I'll say about that is um, I'm optimistic about a few things. One is I'm optimistic that the injunction in West Virginia and Louisiana will ultimately be dissolved and that we will actually have authority over those two states. Um, that court case can't go on for much longer. Um, it's been, it's, you know, sort of taken longer than expected. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that that will change in the next six months or so. Um, I hope that, you know, as part of the, part of the challenge, I think in some of these places is that there wasn't a widespread belief that Heiser was here to stay. And I think that that perspective is shifting. And I think that, um, if the Fifth Circuit decision um, is in Heise's favor and the, and the law is considered constitutional, which again, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic will be the outcome, um, then I think you'll see states like Nebraska and Texas having to change their, their perspective because racing, especially in Texas, you know, I don't think racing in Texas can have a long-term future if Heise is around and they continue to instruct their racetracks not to export the signal because the impact on handle is so significant. And also just even on Texas breads, I mean, if you're an owner and you don't live in Texas and you buy a horse, like you want to see your horse run. And if you can't see your horse run or bet on your horse or whatever, then, you know, I think a lot of the allure uh, changes. So I am hopeful that those things will change in the next, you know, year or so. Um, just casting your eye forward a little bit we've talked quite a bit about responsiveness and how you respond to a series of fatalities how you respond to a drug testing system that isn't really fit for purpose in the 21st century how you know you're putting your fingers over the holes in one part of the can and the water's coming out somewhere else in states that aren't necessarily signed up to HISA or have challenged the legislation what about what you can do proactively what you can do prophylactically 
in terms of increasing safety, not just for horses, but but also for the people riding those horses who we talk about far too little in this conversation, I would I would No, miss. you're hundred percent right. And that's been something um that's been very important to my team and also to me personally is making sure that we're also protecting jockeys physically and mentally. Um, you know, we finally have a national concussion protocol and we have an electronic, me electronic medical record system where we actually called head check, where we actually upload um, those concussions, baseline concussions that, that is mandatory for all jockeys. If they do have an injury, we can make sure that 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 that, that those records, those documents, those those medical um, medical records actually get to a trauma center, et cetera, quickly. And we have the first national medical director, Dr. Pete Hester who is constantly coordinating care for jockeys and constantly making sure that caregivers in different jurisdictions have the information that they need. And you might have also heard about a new initiative um, with regards to jockey mental health. We're working with the Jockeys Guild, who we've worked you know, great partnership with to make sure that we can actually kind of advance things for jockey mental health and make sure that we're you know, doing what we can. And we've got a, lot, a number of industry insiders who are very involved in that. One um, huge constituency that we've barely talked about, and it's to my shame, really, in the last three episodes, is the enormous backstretch community across racetracks in, in the United States. And you will have gone to pretty much every every track and you'll have seen grandstand facilities that are sometimes good, sometimes less good. Yeah. You'll have seen purses that are sometimes good, sometimes outrageously good. Mm -hmm. And yet, in nearly all cases, you'll have seen backstretch facilities that if you took someone who wasn't really that in, into racing around, they'd have said, hmm, these aren't great working conditions, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, for people who are out there in all weathers from very early in the morning, sometimes till very late at night in accommodation that is is distinctly substandard. What can HISA do to help backstretch workers and to ensure that racetracks look after them properly and that and that we the community and horsemen look after them properly as well yeah i mean listen i think that that's a responsibility for the whole community um mm -hmm. including haiza but but not only haiza um what haiza can do i think is we have like a very comprehensive accreditation program um and what we what we do there is we include like the backstretch accommodations and the backstretch workers etc as part of that in, in, you know, inspection as part of that accreditation process. And we do, you know, engage with the with the racetrack owners to make sure that, you know, everything is working properly, that it passes our standards. And that also we try to work with the chaplaincies as well to provide support. So that that mental health work that you were talking about in terms of the riders, that extends to those who ride the horses in the morning those who groom the horses, those who hot walk the horses, those who have anything to do with these animals yeah. will come under your, your auspices. Correct. Correct. I mean, like we, it's not, we're not the only authority in charge. There's obviously also the racing commissions. There's obviously the racetrack, but we do, we do include those areas and include that process in our accreditations. And I suppose really the central point of that is, do you, you know, personally and indeed on behalf of HISA see yourself now as the as the regulatory face of the sport so if somebody says right how do i gauge how do i measure whether this sport is a good place you're happy to stand up at the front of that and say yeah we've got all the not all the answers but uh, we can answer your questions mm -hmm. yes i mean we do i mean listen we're not again we're not the only when it comes to racetracks what I like to say is we kind of share authority with the commissions um, and anything that's not anti-doping. Anti-doping, we're the exclusive authority, but on racetrack safety, on backstretch, on, on jockeys, et cetera. And so we have a responsibility, absolutely. Um, but we do share that responsibility with the racing commissions. But now, Lisa, and I think the point you were making earlier on, that people were kind of skeptical as to the longevity of PISA. Well, it might not be here in a year. It might never get through um might never get through Congress. It might never happen. And if right. it does happen, it's going to fall apart in two seconds flat. Correct. Now you've got the support that you need that it that it won't fall flat on its face and it hasn't fall, fallen flat on its face. Do you now accept that with that comes greater responsibility? Absolutely. People are looking people are looking to you yes. as 
as the sports key leader now. Yes. Do you feel do you feel comfortable with that with that position? I, absolutely, absolutely, I do. Um, we can fix everything overnight, but there's nothing that we're not going to try to make better for the industry. Um, and even for example, you know, I've mentioned before that we've we've sort of catalyzed conversations amongst the sales companies with regards to trying to align with Heise's mission on the anti-doping side. I just offer that as an example of somewhere where we don't have express authority, but we're trying to take a leadership position because we're kind of all in this together. And, and it is a special moment, I think, in horse racing, in that I do believe that most entities, actors, stakeholders understand that we're at a seminal moment and they've got to do their part to help safeguard horse racing. How has the response been to your work on artificial intelligence and how that might help our horses? So very positive. You know, I mean, everyone's, um, you know, you can't possibly like live in the world today and not be exposed to AI and chatbot and, and, and all of that stuff. And so the realization that we can use that in horse racing, I think, is positive. You know, there's some questions about how's that going to work? Is it going to be effective? Um, you know, I think there are some trainers that feel like there's no data that would ever be able to replace their gut instinct. Um, but the reaction to, for example, the tool that we've just developed with Palantir, essentially an algorithm that looks at 42 different data points to see, um, to assign a risk score to each horse that is then provided to you know, the regulatory veterinarians to to help them in their pre-race exams. Um, and then also eventually we're gonna we're gonna share with with trainers and sort of deploy more more widely. Now we're still beta testing it and still improving it. But the reaction to that's been very positive because I think horse racing, um, at least the leaders look around and say, okay, it's it's being used in every other industry. It should be able to help us too. Now I've just asked chat GPT, Lisa. Who runs American horse racing? And the answer is American horse racing is overseen by various entities. It's an inauspicious start, that, isn't it? Uh, that's pretty good. You know, I'm, that's, I'm amazed that they... Uh, they They're very, it's like very that. good. It's frighteningly good, including state racing commissions, regulatory bodies, and industry organizations. The most prominent is the Jockey Club, a breed registry organization that plays a significant role in promoting and regulating blah, 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 blah. Additionally, individual racetracks have their own management teams and ownership groups that govern operations at the track level. Of course, what you want it to say is it's run by HISA. And it doesn't actually mention HISA? HISA is not mentioned. Oh my so God, how... I'm going to have to take issue with that. So how long until this bot recognises HISA, do you think? How long do you think that, that you are enshrined uh, in people's minds rather than just uh, in, the, in the constitution of horse racing? I certainly hope it's not that much longer. We're working very, very hard to change that perception. Um, but I think hopefully if you and I talk again in the next six months or year, that we'll we'll go through this exercise again and I'm and I'm optimistic it'll be different. We'll be I, at least mentioned. And no 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 one no one has criticized you in terms of visibility. You've given a lot of interviews. You have been criticized in terms of accountability and speed of accountability. Do you think your responsiveness speed both individually and as a and as an organization will improve in 2024 will you be quicker on the mark when we have instances like maple leaf mel at saratoga for example yeah we will we've learned a lot from that and i think we become a lot more nimble a lot more educated um just a lot better experienced on how to address all of those issues um and i do think listen i think one thing about Heiser is that We've always taken responsibility, you know, where where we own it and and tried to be better and have not been ashamed about saying we should do something differently than we've been doing it previously based on learned experience. But yes, I mean, listen, when I took this job, I, I had two and two two consultants and I didn't even have a laptop, you know. So since that time, I built an organization and I've built basically like a cadre of advisors that I turn to for guidance. Um, that are comprised of horsemen and owners and, you know, racetrack operators and that have allowed me to be a lot more, I guess, educated in our responses. So, yeah, I think we're just going to continue to get better and better. You you present a, a very um, a very confident image. Have there been moments 
in in the last two years where in your in your quieter moments in your more reflective moments you've thought this job is actually impossible i can't i can't do it i can't bring all these people together and ensure the sports urge your license i've never i've never thought i can't do it i have i have um had the realization this isn't just about a sport you know what i mean like if you look at like the FBI is a great example, you know, there, it was just about a sport. It was just about sport regulation. Same with the NFL. In a horse race and what I've encountered is um, I'm all, I'm often walking into the same political divisions that divide the country at the ballot box, right? That because Heise is a federal law, a lot of the opposition that I'm facing is about government intervention, the federal government and all that. And that's like, that's a bit beyond my pay grade, right? You know what I mean? That's not, you know, I'm not here to fight whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat or you believe in government intervention or you don't. Um, you know, my view is that if a horse racing had been successful with its interstate compacts, if it had been able to agree together to form a national governing body, I wouldn't be here, Haiza wouldn't be here. That never happened. There were a lot of attempts over the years, but it never happened. And there is no sport on the planet, on the planet, forget, forget just the US, on the planet, doesn't have a national regulator, doesn't have a national governing body. I don't know how horse racing survived as long as it did without one, you know? So I've always felt that we were going to get there. Um, you know, how painful it might be and how long it might take, th those certainly, certainly vary. But I I've never thought this this can't happen. Um, now, listen, do I think that I'm ever going to get to a time where I have 100% support? No. You know, there's always going to be a percentage of the industry that don't like it, that don't want to be regulated, that don't think there's a place for national regulation. But what I truly believe is that when I started this job, it was probably at around 70% or 80% that didn't want it. And I think we're cutting it down all the time. And now I would put it more at about maybe 30%, you know, and I'm hoping to just continue to, to plug away at it. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that 70% thinks we do everything right. All I'm asking people is to, is to buy into the concept. You know, we can fight it over whether or not this rule is good or that rule is good or how we do things, but we have to all agree that there has to be a national set of rules and a national regulator. Um, and that's kind of the fight that I'm fighting. And I think that's a winnable fight. Um, we, we began this conversation, you began by talking about your parents and you talked about your mother who you lost quite young. You talked about, uh, helping to bring up your sisters. Um, how do you, what do you think your late mother would say now if she saw you doing the job that you're doing and the way that you've, the way that you've done it? You know, I think she would be incredibly proud. Cause one of the things that she used to always say to me is when I was growing up, you had two choices. You could be a, a teacher or a nurse. And she had three daughters and she would always say to us, you can be anything you want to be. Like, don't limit yourselves. You can, you can be anything you want to be. And my father having three girls also instilled those same values in us. Um, so I think she'd be, I think she'd be proud of, of my strength. And also she was an incredibly empathetic person. And that's something I try to very much bring into the equation is to always put myself in other people's shoes and to try to, to lead with empathy, you know, where I can. Lisa Lazarus, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick.